Wouldn't it be nice to have several thought leaders in your industry know and love your brand? Start a podcast. Invite your industry's thought leaders to be guests on your show and start reaping the benefits of having a network full of industry influencers. Learn more at sweetfishmedia.com. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands. And I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. B2B Growth. I am your host for today's episode, Nikki Ivy with Sweetfish Media. I've got with me today, James Gilbert, who is head of global marketing at Cloud Cherry. James, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. I love your guys' show. Oh, you listen. So you know I'm a little goofy. You know we're going to have fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we're going to be talking about, actually going to be getting really granular about about your LinkedIn approach uh, within outreach and, and, and what folks can do beyond just, you know, make good content. Um, before we get into all of that, James, I would love it if you would give us just a little bit of background on uh, yourself and, and what you and the folks at Cloud Cherry have been up to these days. Yeah. So I've been doing marketing for about 15 years now. Uh, I wouldn't call myself a seasoned pro necessarily, but I've been in it long enough to know a few things. And, you know, at CloudCherry, we, we focus on customer experience. So we offer a SaaS product that helps people with, the, with tracking their customer experience across the journey and making sure that, you know, you're constantly taking the customer in consideration with everything that you do. So we have a really, really cool culture at CloudCherry where we instill that amongst all of our processes. And that's kind of what resulted in some of us, some of us doing some of this A-B testing with LinkedIn was to ensure that we were providing real value for people. That was one of the first questions I was going to ask you is, is what was, what were some of the experiences you guys were having that, that motivated you to do some of the specific kinds of testing that you did? Well, you know, it was about six, seven months ago, we had a consultant come in that was uh, consulting our sales team, our marketing team on some best practices on things that we could maybe do differently to try and grow revenue a little bit quicker. And he happened to have been somebody who used to be on the board of directors at LinkedIn. And he shared a few snippets of information that we wanted to try out. And, you know, what, the first thing he told us was, you know, if all you're doing is liking uh, your posts, you're not going to get anywhere. And that kind of shocked us all because that's primarily what we, what we were doing. So we started testing some of the things out that he talked about. And that's kind of what got us into doing it is we wanted to make sure that we were getting the value out of LinkedIn that we wanted to get. And we wanted to make sure that people were getting the value out of the content that we were putting out there. Measuring that out of a social platform has, is historically pretty difficult. Uh, right. So you, how we measured it was very, very manual in nature, but it worked. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what I was going to ask you about is sort of what was the, the methodology in running the test? And you mentioned that it was pretty manual. I'm right away just going to ask you straight out, what were some of the first things that you learned that sort of dispelled some of the ideas that you might have gone into this testing with, the things that you believed to be true that just got completely obliterated by this research? Well, I've told you this, Nikki, but I'm not an expert in social media. You know, that's a function within my group, but I'm definitely not an expert. So, you know, one of the things that we wanted to do really, really clearly was to understand, you know, if we're looking at other posts, you know, Somebody who I, I admire from a social media standpoint is Gary V, who everybody knows. Right. And there's a reason why everybody knows him. If you look at the content that he does or other people that are considered influencers in, in marketing or any type of space, but they get a lot of influencers and, and, and uh, followers through LinkedIn, one thing that they have in common is all of their posts have a significant amount of comments and shares. Mm -hmm. And 
we we had this theory where we were seeing stuff that were getting into our thread and we had never seen it before, but it was, you know, a rant that somebody had and it just had a ton of comments in it. It had no business value necessarily, but it was just a rant and people were commenting on it and they were engaging in it. And before LinkedIn came out with their new algorithm, which is where they they give hearts and claps uh, and light bulbs as alike, we started posting a bunch of stuff and we wanted to see, you know, what would happen if we had our entire organization uh, and the sales team and marketing team just like our posts? Let's see if we can gain some traction. So we started doing that. Uh, it was the same methodology, the same type of content that we were promoting, and we weren't getting anywhere almost no followers. And as a brand that's still new to the space, we, we needed that more than ever. So this was sort of a testing of our brand out as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When we started doing the likes, it just, it didn't work. So then we started doing a combination of likes and comments and we would do long tail comments and short tail comments. And the funny thing is, is it made no difference on the length of the comment, which a lot of people think that they've got to have these really lengthy comments and that's not the case. It literally could just be a single word of a comment. That's the algorithm that LinkedIn is looking at. And that's, what's, that's what actually will help you trend. So that, those were some really cool things that we didn't anticipate. Uh, we were really shocked by, and they, they worked really well for us. What that brings to mind for me, though, right, is, okay, so we figured out that it's not just simply counting likes, thank God. Uh, we figured out, and, and by figured out, I just mean it's what we learned from what you, you guys tested. And you, you learn that comments matter, and, and that that's sort of a way to, to work the algorithm in your favor. But how do you get those comments? And what I'm thinking is, I know a lot of folks, even myself, I've tried to use hashtags as a way to get, you know, more visibility on a post to get more people to comment. What do you see with respect to hashtags? So listen, hashtags, they work, but they only work to get your content in front of the audience. It does not necessarily guarantee engagement. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that you're seeing in LinkedIn, uh, you're seeing this in Instagram, you're seeing it in a lot of the social platforms, it's just really raw video of people being themselves when they're seen as a, a business leader, okay? And I think there's there's clout to this because I think more and more people are gonna want to see a human behind the scenes and not just textual content. So I think that that's why you see a lot of uh, things that like Gary Vee does where he's going on a rant about, about things and people are just like eating it up, right? And they're commenting like crazy. I think it's a matter of producing really raw, uh, unedited content that you just, you put out there and let people engage with it. We've been trying this a little bit, especially recently with, with our brand at Cloud Cherry, where we host webinars all the time. And we, we saw everybody doing webinars where they were, they were doing like a scripted PowerPoint deck right. and it would lure people to sleep. So instead, we decided to change. We were going to invite somebody in and we were going to have a live, almost like a, a, a video podcast. Right. And we were just going to talk about customer experience with them and those have been huge hits and really engaging. People engage a lot more in those type of things when they see that it's a raw format mm-hmm. and that it's not really formal. Um, they're more likely to engage. And we found that firsthand. I've seen a lot of that as, as well with what folks, some folks are doing with LinkedIn Live and with their, with their video content. That's one of the other questions I had about you know, video and, and images. There's these sort of two different experiences that folks are having, right? So there's this, push where folks are saying, you know, you got to use video and video is going to get folks, you know, to, to engage with you. And then there's this idea that the LinkedIn algorithm actually punishes video or, or favors text over video. Do you guys find anything interesting with respect to those ideas? Well, again, I think it's 100% the type of content. And I think mm-hmm. LinkedIn has kind of figured that out. When it comes to video, I mean, marketing videos are things that are going to actually sell you product. They aren't going to work. But if it's a video that's engaging and it, it creates conversation, uh, that's where you see people just literally recording themselves on their phone and putting it up on LinkedIn because they had a thought for the day or something like that. Mm-hmm. That type of video is engaging and it does trend. If you look at most of the folks that do that, they don't even necessarily have to put hashtags in, in their posts. And that's simply because the videos, the videos do trend. Um, we did see 
the images worked, but they only worked again if you weren't selling, if you weren't mm-hmm. pushing your product. Okay. And, you know, that could have just been unique to us. Uh, it might work for others to do it differently. But I also think that's another thing that you can take away from this is there's no secret sauce to to doing a lot of this stuff. Like right. it's, it's very, very much, you have to test what works for you. And while it, in theory, it'd be great if there was some sort of secret sauce to getting everything to trend uh, in LinkedIn, that's just not reality. You know, and I think it's a matter of putting, to, putting together really organic content that's raw, uh, that people just want to see you know, real human interaction with business. I know you said you're not an expert, but you guys, you know, it sounds like you, you do have a lot of experience, at least with what, what you learned from this, uh, this round of testing that you did. And, and it's, it's got me thinking, um, for <laughs> folks who are, who are wanting to, to really you know, ramp this up, whether it's for their personal branding or, or for their business, for one of the things I, I sort of struggled with when I was starting out is do I begin with my you know, my energy toward building an audience and seeing how many connections slash followers I have, or do I just start making sure that I'm consistently putting out the content? Where, where did you start there? Oh man, that's, that's a better question for Gary uh, than than myself. I mean, he talks about it all the time. I think that it's a fine line to draw between quantity versus quality. Uh, Sure. But do you I do, know, could, could you talk about maybe where you guys started in terms yeah. of what your, your connections or following followers uh, numbers were to begin with and then what you found after you implemented some of the things you learned? Yeah. So to put it into context, historically, we were, we were, we had a really strong presence over in the APAC region. So the Asia Pacific, we didn't have a strong presence in North America. And we recognized that and we knew that we needed to grow that, that image over here in North America. So we had to make some pretty significant changes with our brand to start. And then once we did that, we, we really focused on just trying to, again, generate raw content. We didn't worry about whether we were going to get a following or not. Um, we didn't worry about whether it was going to, we were going to have like these, oh man, I just lost my train of thought, but you know what it's called when something goes Viral. Yeah, that's what it's called. <laughs> yeah, but we, we don't worry about something going viral or anything like that. Uh, so we, we really just focused on being consistent. And that worked for us. Consistency. Yeah. One of the things that we do now in our social media is on Facebook and Instagram, which we know are very, very heavy on uh, video and images. We post a net new video that's usually less than 40 seconds every day at 12 um, mm-hmm. during somebody's lunchtime. And it usually goes off of like the, the national social media calendar where there's a theme. Okay. So you'll have like themes per day and we'll do a video, a short one that just gets people, you know, either thinking about that topic for the day or gets people tuning in during that time. And then sometimes we'll throw out a video that's a little bit longer. That's a little bit more engaging, but I think that that's what more brands are going to have to do is they're going to have to just be consistent um, with what they're producing. And that's how you do it. I think that's what's worked for us. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't, I don't think that, you know, for, for me or for our listeners, I don't think you can hear enough times how important consistency is when it comes to this specific thing. And so thanks for talking about this and letting us know what you learn and, and, uh, and the way that you laid that out for us. And so now that I have successfully picked your brain and seen what I could get out of it, I'm interested, uh, James, in what you are putting in it. So tell us about uh, a learning resource that you've uh, engaged with recently that, you know, has informed your approach of this just got you excited these days. You know, there's a, uh, there's a few different learning resources that I, I, I tend to go to when it comes to social media. Cause I, again, I'm not an expert in it. Right. Sure. So I have to have to tap into better expertise than myself. So, you know, I do, I do follow Gary because look, like whether you agree with him every single time that he posts something or not, like he's figured it out and like he's got it down. So uh, I think that that's, there's some clout to that. And so I follow him a lot when it comes to social media. I also recently read a book a few months ago called The Marketing Rebellion, which I highly recommend to any marketers out there. If you have not read that, you are doing yourself a disservice. <laughs> It's probably one of the best books I've ever read and probably one of the most controversial. And it really focuses on just bringing the human experience back into marketing. And I love it for that reason. I think some of the other areas that I go to for social media is I follow Sprout Social. 
who, who does a really great job at their blog content, their live Twitter chats. They just, they got a lot of really good templates that you can use and, and suggestions as well. So those are really the three sources I go by. I love it. The marketing rebellion. That sounds like something I got to get my hands on. I'm, I'm nothing if not a rebel. Yeah, you <laughs> definitely got to read it. It's fantastic. So I know a lot of folks uh, like me uh, have are excited about what, what it is that you guys uh, tested out and, and, and what we can learn from what you guys found and are going to want to connect with you. Uh, James, how can people keep up with you? Best way to do it is through LinkedIn. I know a lot of people want to throw their Twitter handle out there, but like I use Twitter for sports. So unless you want to like learn about the Utah Jazz, that's probably <laughs> better. Go to LinkedIn um, and find me on LinkedIn. I, I don't ignore a connection ever. So. Well, I love the little tidbit about the Utah Jazz. I grew up a, a huge fan of the NBA in the in the 90s. And now, but I, I lived in um, Washington State, so I was a supersonic fan time. This was the, the time when you had like your, your Gary. Sean Payton, Camp, and, Gary Sean Payton. Payton like, right? It was all of that. But but it was the time also like when the West overall was like huge and it was always a dogfight and you had like to get through Stockton and Malone to like do anything. Uh, so this is what you remind me of when you say uh, the jazz. Oh, I know. I was, I, was, I was there. I was there during all those times when you guys used to count at the free throw line for Malone when he was at the <laughs> I remember. <laughs> it was trolling before it was called trolling. Uh, but anyway, thank you so much for coming on the show. Like I said, I can't wait to go out and connect with you and, and, and learn more and hopefully implement some of this stuff and, and see what I can make happen with uh, with my personal brand. Thank you again so much, James, for coming on the show, man. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Hey guys, if you've been listening to B2B Growth for a while, you know we're good friends with Sangram over at Terminus. So we wanted to let you know something really cool he's up to lately. This week and this week only, Sangram's newest book, ABM is B2B, is available for just $1.99. That's right, $1.99, a steal from the regular $14.95 price. And here are a few reasons why you wanna check out this book. One, you'll learn stories from six companies and the specific steps they took to take their ABM program from good to great. You'll also learn the team framework that Sangram talks about and is time-tested in over 100 companies. If that's not enough, they're giving away 100% of the profits and $10 per review of the book to the New Story charity. So check out the link in the show notes to take advantage of this screaming deal and get your copy of ABM Is B2B by Sangram Vajray and Eric Spett on Amazon for just $1.99 this week.